feel very casual. That's a good thing. <laughs> we I, should be. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, some people make it super extreme and it's kind of boring. I have no clue where we're hitting up talking. All we talk is about dogs, about you, what you're doing, and, and maybe you want to introduce yourself a little bit, tell us a little bit what you do and how you end up doing what you do. And how do you end up with the dog decoder in the first place? Ah, well, doing, being a dog trainer for many, many years and seeing that a lot of people that have had dogs all their lives just don't really understand their dogs. They don't even know what they don't know. And um, I had been actually in the middle of a video in production on a video about eight years ago or 10 years ago about dog body language. And at the time, there wasn't a good video out. There were a couple of books, but they're very boring and they're big and you have to carry the book with you to go, what's that dog doing? And um, it was just really frustrating. So we were mid-production and the entire time, I was looking online to see if anybody else was doing a body language video. And I saw that Cesar Milan was putting out his first dog body language video. And I halted the production because I am no competition for his money. <laughs> and he can, has the money to advertise and sell big. And, and I thought, you know what, I'm not going to even compete with that. So I put it, uh, we stopped mid production and then, then, the bite happened with that newscaster in Denver. Did you ever, did you see that? Yeah, whole yeah, thing? Yeah. yeah. With, the, so, with the German Shepherd, with the police dog? Actually, no, it was a, a, a Cane Corso that had, oh, I missed that. so it was, Kyle Dyer was a newscaster on the Good Morning Show on Denver. And the day before, a man was walking his dog in Denver. It saw a coyote, it was a Cane Corso, it saw a coyote, took off after the coyote onto a lake and the coyote fell in, and so did his dog. And he called the fire department to help. The fire department came and got it. The whole thing was on, on video. They, somebody taped the entire thing, and they pulled the dog out. The coyote clearly succumbed, but they pulled the dog out, and I watched the video, and it, before the, you know, the, the dog was on TV, I watched it, and as soon as he put the dog down, the fireman put the dog down, you saw the dog kind of look at him and, and look at him and just kind of slink away like, okay, I'm on ground now, you buddy, you better go. So clearly that was my first indication that this dog was an aggressive dog. No one else saw that, whether it was just from that initial trigger of pure fear of survival and right. you know almost dying, or was he an aggressive dog prior to, I don't know, but it, that is, was my first sign that this was trouble. Then what happened is they thought, oh, let's do a good Samaritan story on the next, you know, tomorrow morning. I don't think the dog went to a vet because he survived it. So he didn't go to a vet. But clearly he was traumatized. Now he's in a studio with lights all over and people Googling over him, you know, like, <laughs> oh, look at this puppy. He's so good. And the owner knows something. Yeah, the owner knows yeah, his yeah, dog yeah. has got some issues and nobody's paying attention to any of the body language. And now they're on air. Fire department, fireman is here. There's a table in between him and the owner is holding his dog in the picture that you posted for this ad is the exact picture that I had Lily Chin draw. So he's now sitting in, I'm going to put this down. He's sitting in between the guy's legs and he's holding his collar like yeah, this, yeah, holding yeah, his yeah. collar loosely. And she's all goo goo over his face. And finally, she gets too close. You can see in a slow motion video, the guy go like that. As soon as he goes like that, that subtle movement, the dog bites her in the mouth. Right, right. All the signs were there. This dog was telling her for five minutes, leave me alone. And he bit her. And that's when at two o'clock in the morning, I went, how can I help? How can I make this a difference here with dog bites? a video of what you know I'm doing what I can with and then I it dawned on me everybody's using their phones make this a virtual thing that they can carry with them everywhere I didn't know a developer I knew people that could draw and people that could help me but I didn't know somebody so I started my search and it was crazy trying to find somebody that would do this and I finally found my girlfriend's husband was a developer 
I get it. <laughs> the universe. <laughs> yeah. And I talked to him and it took us a year. Lily got her stuff done with me right away. And I only did 60 images. Clearly, there's a lot more I could do, but I needed to put something out and get that out and see how it goes. And right away, I started to, you know, people started to recognize what, what this was. Veterinarians and behaviors use it in their clinics, and they show their clients on their iPad, look at this is what your dog is doing. So it's, you know, I'm just really grateful that now shelters use it, dog trainers use it, you saw it somewhere. And it's just something that we can carry around. And kids love it. You know, they teach their parents. Go ahead. I think, I think the idea is awesome. A couple of years back, I had the same thought because I said, you know what, there's something out there that ha we have to reach out to. Every, everybody has his own <clears throat> translations of what the dog, that behavior means. We have the scientific community says the one thing. We have the celebrity trainer says something else. We have the veterinary behaviorist. They say something else. We have the books. They say something else. I'm like, hey guys, is there anything out there that actually says it the right way? Are we judging the animals by the animals' posture, or can we actually find out the function of that posture? Because most people judge the dog by the posture. That's a good thing because we can see a little bit, but we don't understand the background behind that. Mm -hmm. So while, while you already start designing the part of, you know, the view analysis, what do I see? What does it mean? Which is awesome. Perfect. I was wondering, would you go a step further and say that plus this plus that plus this, this is the sentence, the function of what you see, one plus one plus one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in actuality, yes. But in creating this first, you know, idea, this first concept in this, I needed to meet the masses yeah. on, on their level. And, and, and also, if you can think about it, the good news is the developer was not a dog person. So when I would give a description, he would say, that I, I don't get it. It's too long. It's too many details. This is an app. We need to make this very concise, pare it down into something that I can reach people with that yeah. isn't going to be too complicated. That and was very so, helpful, right? Because you, you brought it down to a level where the actual children can figure out what it is. Hey, mommy, this yep. is what it does. Yep. Yep. And so, and that's why we did it in three parts, the pose and then the information and then the body parts talking. So yeah, the, the goal now is to actually is to make another app or add to this one more of what you're the saying, next, put the, the pieces level. together and more training, like do this, don't do that. And because, we're, you know, we have to remember the dog doesn't show their emotional state in a vacuum. It's in a dynamic. It's the environment has something to do with the, the person at the other end of the leash or in the room with them, the family dynamic, it, nothing happens in a vacuum. So the context is what creates the emotional behavior and how we respond to that, we can make that behavior bigger or we can help alleviate that anxiety, that anxious behavior. And it doesn't happen through correcting them. It happens through understanding this, their right, state, right. what makes that happen. And then how can we relieve or relieve some of that anxiety from them and not think of it as I'm going to stop this problem. It's, it's not that way. It doesn't work that way. Dogs don't work. We don't work that way. <laughs> well, he is a, that's a great point. I'm going to grab it right there. Um, I see many trainers try to make a separation between animals and people. There, there is kind of like a taboo. We cannot compare animals with people. Well, you know, no, you cannot. And you cannot compare a dog with a cat. That's because they are two different species. But I see you start touching that area and I really like it. And I, and I like the fact that you draw in that information as a psychologist and says, wait, we have, we have a species that is emotionally intelligent. We have um, a mammal. And they express themselves in, in the family context with each other. So basically, they're not different than homo sapiens, not different than human beings. 
because we have all one common denominator. We have a family emotional system that we work on. Mm -hmm. So we can exactly. directly draw conclusions. Okay, let's see what's the level, emotional level of a dog. And we know already science already catches already five years of uh, like a five-year-old child emotional level. And so we say already, yeah, well, there's a little bit guilt there, but we don't, cannot call it guilt really, but we're not sure, we cannot prove it because we cannot measure it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. Right. And I, and I like the fact that you were able to convey that human psychology into the dog psychology because there are many trainers out there who have a psychology background and especially the celebrity trainers. Some of them are just opportunist trainers. They mm -hmm. had an opportunity, got trainers, boarding training, pet sitting, blah, boom, great TV show. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that some of them conveyed the idea of animal psychology and brought that into surface. Mm -hmm. We disagree with the methods they used, but you know, they kind of imprinted that, hey, there's a dog psychology and everybody's like, oh, dog psychology. Mm -hmm. And then finally we have somebody here who says, well, this is how it looks like. Take my phone, dog psychology. Mm -hmm. Click on it, understand what it is, let's do a quiz about it. And that's kind of like awesome because kids can learn through questions. Interactive, inter an interactive game that teaches the kids to use their phone, observe what they do, have the parents involved. So you hit one, like three ends on one shot, the kids, mm -hmm. the parents, and the dog. Right, right. Awesome. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, how, how can I encourage you to do more? Um. So it's not that I don't want to do more, believe me. So what, what, what I'm doing is I write. So I write for a couple of dog magazines for Dogster, the whole dog journal, the animal wellness, I'm, and I blog. And so my voice has gotten bigger in that way. But it's, it's financially to make another app or to add to this is a big chunk. It's not a cheap thing. It's not an inexpensive task to take on. Give so, a number. In order to do what I want to do now, yeah. so, so the app has gained its notoriety by me. Mm -hmm. I, I had no, there, when I started this, when the app came out five years ago, there were no commercials or advertising for apps. Now there's an app for everything and there's commercials. For me to just advertise this app on a commercial is about $15,000 for 30 seconds for one ad. One ad. So. If I put enough money in, if I put money back into creating the adding to this app with all the things that I want to do, it needs to go in many different languages. I get calls all the time. Well, can you put it in this language, in this language? So there's so much to be done and I can put the money into that, but then who's going to find out about it again? It's, I have been the sole source of advertising. So I'm still hanging on and waiting until it actually goes viral. If it mm -hmm. goes viral, there's no end. I have so many different pieces that I want to add to this. I also have a horse one that I want to do. Cats are different, but horses are as important as dogs because they are worse off as far as their, the science-based training. Horses are abused. They're way behind the dog world, and the dog world is behind. So there's a lot to be done. I see we're moving out of um, dark age of dog training and horse training. Mm -hmm. Um, like basically the last 10 years, basically we're coming into the idea and says, or 20 years coming back and says, Hey, you know, the, it's a good old way. It worked fine so far, but there's a better way to handle it. Mm -hmm. And we see like, like Buck, the horse trainer, great example. He's coming mm -hmm. from a traumatic experience as a child. He knows how trauma feels like. <clears throat> and I feel we as dog trainers and behaviorists, we're coming from the same angle in order to tap into that field of animal behavior and understanding empathetically what's going on and see the big picture. You have to have been through some stuff right. in order to become aware of that. Right. Um, what do you think What was the, the biggest challenge for you to, to dump it down to that level that kids and parents can recognize it? What was the, what was the challenges? Well, I talk a lot. I, I'm a detailed person. I want details. I give details, stories. So that was the hardest part for me, is how do I pare this down into something that's so simple? Getting it down to 60 images. I had like 400. 
you know, there were so many scenarios and the way I chose to do it was situations, the most common situations that people find themselves in. Mm -hmm. I paired that 400 down to 60. That was not easy. Which of the 60 most important things? There's so many more, you know that. Yeah, yeah. There's so many more scenarios I could come up with. Um, so that was the hardest part. I, I, I had, when I got these, in, you know, the, the scenarios each, that was so easy for me to do. I gave them to Lily. I said, draw this. I think one time did I have to say, can you change, can you tweak that? I gave her enough details and pictures that she, and she's so good at it, and she's not a trainer. But she got what I asked for because of the details, and she was able to draw that out of all of that. Only one time did I have to say, tweak this head over this way with the eye looking this way once. And so... What would be a behaviorist if you cannot convey information to a person? Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's not something that... I'm, and I look at a lot of the dog trainers around that have that are 10 years into being dog, a dog trainer. Um, and they're, I'm going to just put this out there. I do not believe in force free. And what I mean by that is as soon as we put a leash on a dog, we're forcing them to be six feet from us, 20 feet from us. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm not hurting the dog or inflicting pain or doing anything like that, there's no such thing as force free training. So with but the, with there, the there's, a, there's a conscious line between, Wearing a seatbelt is not a f is not force free, but right. it's part of safety. Right. So there Absolutely. is kind of an ethical borderline. What what what? How do we understand force? Okay. If right. We can, if, if we can manage that that an animal <clears throat> or a person voluntarily offers a behavior, mm -hmm. and then we only have a backup plan in place just in case the system fails. Mm -hmm. This is what I see. If leashed, le holding a leash and having a leash on a collar is not forceful yet right yes we're talking about slavery here because the dogs cannot run, walk away from free it doesn't have a lot of choices right but i feel one thing that we have in common here as, as you and me at least and i think more people are out there but they have to step up to that level and say hey you know what i i try to help animals reach the maximum level where they can be free in a social safe environment. Mm -hmm. We took animals from their environment, brought them into a house, mm -hmm. called them pets, uh -huh. <laughs> stamp them and seal them and brand them with that term mm -hmm. by ignoring the natural environment. Absolutely. It's kind of like taking a person and putting in a factory. Well, he's free to leave. Well, if he frees to leave, then he will be fired. Then when are gonna starve to death? Right. How, how free are you kind of thing? Right. right? Um, but with animals, we have, we have to deal with more complex situations because we control the food, we control their exercise, we control their exit, we control how much light they have, we control how much they sleep, we control how they feel about things. And when they go to the bathroom. The exactly, right? <laughs> so free doesn't exist anymore. Right, right. And so we, again, we have to up the limit a little bit and say, okay, how much comfort can we give in a prisoner Absolutely. Who said that just for life? Right. Can we give him books? Can we give him entertainment? What kind of entertainment? Like, what giving him a TV is entertainment? Giving a dog a, a Kong toy is entertainment? No, not at all. It's just one part of all these different types of entertainments he has, including in the intimate relationship with his partner, mm -hmm. with his dog or a human. Nail clipping, ear clipping, these are part of, you know, entertainments. Right. Right. So, right. Well, it's, it, it's so nice to hear you speaking like that because they are living in a human-dominated world and we just want them to fit in without realizing what their needs are. And when we don't meet their needs is when you and I get the call. <laughs> the behaviors get, start getting out of control. And, and, and we hate those calls because we have to convince and we cannot say it, hey, you have a narcissistic behavior here. You want the dog to comply to something he's not capable of complying and you're punishing him for not matching your picture. Right. Like chopper mom or chopper dad is kind of like an easygoing texture, but if we look at reality, what's really is behind that term and mm -hmm. you are a psychologist educated at least, we know those terms. People are hard to digest that. Right. You kind of destroy their, their, their virtual reality. Oh, I'm a good parent. I feed my dog twice a day. How old is your dog? Uh, he's 12 weeks. 
<laughs> really? And then you wonder why he bites you kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these are small details. So I had a conversation yesterday, kind of like a Facebook conversation, uh, sorry, Facebook conversation with international behaviorists in England that um, there was a, a, a scientific research of how people resist to um, recognize that they are not offering what the dog needs and the resistance behind that. Mm -hmm. And then some, some of those behaviorists basically said, well, you cannot judge people for not having this welfare to animals. And I said, why not? Just because they have a different culture doesn't make it okay to leave the dog without water. Just because you have a different religion doesn't mean your dog can stay in a crate for 12 hours straight. Make sense? Yeah. And, yeah. and so we have to kind of like open up this, um, let's call it taboo. And we as behaviorists at least, we have to start talking about that without feeling this conflict of interest. Well, if I share information with you, you're gonna take my clients. There's so many clients out there. I don't need afraid of you taking my clients or I'm taking your clients. You know, can we share clients? Of course, even better. We can help more rescues and more shelters never right. be full again. Right. Yeah, yeah there's a, a big division between trainers and I think competition is a good thing. Um, I think that we can all help each other. I, that is the best way that we can come together. And even the ones that are, you know, when you asked me for an interview, I had to find out who you were, <laughs> right? And, you know, and so what, who is this person? And, you know, are they a shock jock? And, and sometimes, you know, when I, when somebody does ask me to do something and I find out that they are using a, a, a shock collar, for me, I have a choice. I can say no, or I can say, can we talk first? Because I, 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 can't, I don't use shock collars and I'd like to know why you think it's okay. Right. And, um, I think that if we can open the dialogue and support each other in that way, we're helping many more dogs than we are by keeping us, by, by staying divided. Mm -hmm. And we really need to focus on, on the outside, not here. You know, there's a lot of dog trainers out there. And again, you know, we're not licensed, so we can help each other. And if people get just as if, just like an owner feels the resistance, the dog trainers feel the same resistance yeah. and don't know how to, sh how to share that and work together. Some do, we are. I feel there's a lot of passion with every trainer doing what he wants to do. I feel like 90% of trainers love what they do. They love to have animals. And again, I, I try not to judge and try to see that really it is gray zone that some really think they do the right thing. Just like you and me believe doing that way is the right thing to do. And they believe 100% what they do is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then we have to be so aware and says, hey, let's put it down in science. What does science have to do? Can I prove my concept and my idea? Because most of those people are relying on those influential posts. And just because it's available in the market doesn't make it okay. Right. And just because somebody talked about that and make a meme out of it, how cool it is, doesn't make it okay. And just because many people write a blog post, just like you and me, and talk about certain stuff, if it's okay or not, does it make it still a scientific fact? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, we can go back into quantum field that says, well, if I focus long enough on my idea, I may find the scientific evidence that I can move a little bit around and change a little bit of word and get it exactly where I want it to get. <laughs> yeah, you can do that too. But if at the end, those empaths, and I think you're an empath as well, you can feel how animals feel like, and that's why you're good what you do. Mm -hmm. We recognize that what science says is it's just what we can prove. It just feels different when you look closer into that. Right. And that's the key, is learning how to look at another animal, including you and me. I mean, we're in a... Once you learn body language, you can't not see it in every person you interact with. You can't not see it. And sometimes I just have to shut it off because it's a lot. And people don't, they're not even aware of their own body language and how they're creating something with a conversation you and I are having or with a conversation they're having with their own dog or a dog that comes into their world. But I, 
I, uh, just an example, somebody talked about body, this is speaking exactly to what you just said. Somebody tagged me, tagged Dog Decoder about, hey, here's another thing Dog Decoder put out about body language. Let's get into this body language conversation. Look at this situation. This is how I teach come with a shock collar. Look, the body language is soft, it's wiggly, it's not scared, tail's not down. Went into this whole thing about how this dog was okay with being a shock, being shocked to teach <laughs> to come. I looked at the video and she tagged me on it. I didn't know who this person was, but she tagged me. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, who's, you know, who's promoting dog decoder? Yay. And I look at this video and she's, the dog's tail is not up. It's not wagging. It's just, you know, kind of there. It's not down. It's not even flaccid. It's just there. I saw sniffing in this displacement sift sniffing. And at the end of 30 seconds, the dog came to her after being zapped five or six times, came to her. And both times it came to her on her own just to come because it didn't want to be zapped, went to her on her own. She never treated, only treated after a zap. She rewarded. But as soon as the, the 30 seconds was over, the dog did a major shake off. So I just posted uh, in, in that post, I commented, no, your dog is not happy. It's not a loose and wiggly body. You miss this displacement sniffing and you miss the shake off at the end. If you're going to talk about body language, you need to look at the body language from beginning to end. I never no, no, heard no, no, that. No, 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 no. That's totally wrong because I just want to look at what is my convenience. Right. That's exactly <laughs> speaking to what you just said. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the dog yeah. wasn't showing obvious signs of yeah, distress, yeah. didn't mean it wasn't stress. And Let's go back to the stress part. But what I figured happened with that dog is probably shocked a lot for pulling. So every time he hit the end of the leash, she called it and came. I don't know. That's just my assumption. But um, there are stresses. Every time we teach a dog something new, there's stress. People that have speaking in public, you know, anxiety, they're stressed. Does that mean they stop doing it? So there's good stress and there's bad stress. And we just have to pay attention to the body language is this, can I push this dog just a little bit more in what I'm teaching to see if he has it is a good stress. But if I push a little bit more and the dog starts to shut down, I push too far and I need to take a step back. Yeah. So we need to know when to challenge and when to hold back. And that I think is a real, that's not something that comes naturally to dog trainers. Yeah. I, I had a conversation, text conversation this morning with one of my mentees, you do mentoring too, by the way, I just give everybody a heads up. Um, and so there was a conversation. He, he sent me a, a, exactly the same picture. He sent me a video of a guy talking about the e-collars and he says, what's your opinion? I want you to watch the video and give me your opinion because he, he has this way of saying how okay um, the, the use of shock collars are, by the way. And I kind of went in a text round and kind of like, busted the myths of each individual step he talked about yes and with scientific facts i didn't have the link but i could say i just was texting and so i was back and forth with the links but it's interesting where people actually don't recognize the the physiology of animals and they don't understand the energetic systems of animals so if somebody tells me the dog doesn't feel the shock collar you feel it yourself i says dude I'm sorry, we have five layers between our skin and our, our, and our receptors. Dogs have only three. So therefore, there is two times or three times more energy going through their field. And even the magnetic field of a collar before it charges makes already an effect on a dog. And by the way, do you understand the term helplessness? <laughs> and I was like, what? What? <laughs> Well, there's a scientific evidence being used with the shock collar to prove the effect of helplessness mm -hmm. on a dog with an e-collar. Mm -hmm. So what more proof do you want that helplessness exists in dogs with the use of a shock collar? Mm -hmm. And just because he comes to you wagging his tail because he wants to go on a walk and helpless as he wants, he gives up on trying to resist the e-collar. Of course, he will be happy to put the e-collar on and get out for a walk. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to drive you around and I have a gun on my head, making sure I survive to come home. Mm -hmm. Okay, where do you want to go? I get you, you, you want my business card too? <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense? Yep. And so I feel, I feel, it feels sad to me that sometimes we have to explain something that's so obvious. 
and people just don't look at it because it's not convenient. Because many people are coming from this ego space and say, you know what, it's just convenient for me to believe that way and that's what it is. And then they get shocked if it's not. And they say, ah, they don't, they don't even read your posts because they don't even read your scientific proof. They just don't take it. Okay. Right, and I think the, the one key word that you just said, I'll take it to a different level, is convenience. It's fast. It doesn't matter if it, because you have to remember the, 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 the psychology. So when I was nine or 10, I started following Jane Goodall when she mm -hmm. first started going out. And that's kind of where I got my observation mindset from. Um, this is the lady who followed the chimpanzees, her life yes. purpose. Yes, yes. Just for everyone to okay. know. Yeah. yeah. And so before she w went out and in, in, in the fields, in the forest with the chimpanzees, Animals did not have a personality. They were a number, and they didn't have personality. Even in the scientific world, they didn't have emotions, and they didn't have personalities. Thank you, so, sir. Yeah, so anybody, that, and, and you know, she's on her 50th uh, anniversary of when she started. So in 50 years, in the beginning, when she started to give it names, give these, these chimps names, the scientific community tried to push her out of the, out of the way. You don't give your study, it's you know, character. <laughs> so it's really, so, so what we're up against is 50 years still, it's still new. So people are still of the mindset that it's just an animal. And if it's easier for me to teach my dog to come to me for sure and shock it that way, it's just an animal, it's okay. So they're still in that mindset 50 years later, even though we all, even though 50 years ago, anybody that had a dog knew they had a personality and feelings and emotions, the scientific world, it was blasphemy. So given that it, it's a slow move, listen, women just have rights now, gays just have rights now. Animals are far behind that still. It's a small, so I'm 64 years old, but, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't talk about, the only people that talked about psychology were the, was the psychological community. We didn't talk about mental health issues. We didn't, it was not out in the open. So it's really still baby steps that animals do have feelings and emotions on a scientific level. If science can really come, and it's not even just up to us dog trainers, but if science can come up even more than we will be able to regulate dog trainers because no one will get away with what Milan gets away with. No one will. It'll be outlawed. Well, like it is in many countries now, it's outlawed. Using a shock collar is illegal. Yeah. So it's still that mindset that is still prevalent in today's dog owners, unfortunately. And that's our battle. I'm wondering what happened because if you look a couple of thousand years back or even like let's say 100 years back, going backwards 2,000, 3,000 years, even in the ancient um, Native American cultures, there's a clear evidence that there is a value behind the dog as right. a species. Right. And I, I don't remember which, which um, um, not clan, um, the Native Americans are- Tribes. Tribes right? Uh, which tribe actually said before, um, when, when God created the humans, they had to be approved by the dog. And because the humans didn't treat the dog well, God removed the humans and brought new humans into it. Like, wait a minute, what is this coming from? It's not kind of like, why dogs? Why replacing humans? Whatever that context is, th there is a truth in it for that to exist. So mythology is based on a reality, just a little bit conveyed to information people can understand. And then yeah. we go, we look at ancient cultures and Egyptian cultures where actually dogs were goddesses and gods. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're like, wait a minute, that's kind of like 3,000 years back. And now, I think when we became industrialized. Exactly. There was this start we, that we can go down and talk into, you know, parascience, but we're not going so far for now. But I, I see that we were in a good place, then we declined. We went dead end, and then there was nothing. And then we have religion where we threw people to the dogs, and there's no mention of dogs at all. 
And all of a sudden now we rediscover the dog. I said, wait a minute, dog is the best man, man's best friend. <laughs> Great title. Well, did anybody question if we are the dog's best friend? Right. Right. And we don't see the evolutionary aspect and anthrozoologist, make it the right word, have discovered that dogs live in human societies over hundred thousand of years. And dogs are not really evolving directly from wolves that we know now, but they have a common ancestors. And we, we say, well, these people used to breed dogs. They did affect genetics in one way or the other. And then we have the starch factor. That's another genetic manipulation of animals. We have what? The starch factor. Where science proved because of the starch factor in animal digest, the record Oh, okay, animal. got it, got it, okay. And so the, that is another factor. So we can trace it back to the origin. And then we see that suddenly these dog relationships, human dog relationships, show up in different areas in the world without them directly connected. Not through water streets, not through business exchanges or, or you know, value exchanges. It just was there. And then we have the cataclysm. And what happened before that? Just because everything was washed away doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right, right. So I, I, think, I think we're in a good road and I want to kind of like going into the closing with a happy ending that you are doing a great job and I really appreciate it. I'm not getting weepy. Aww. For you putting the word out there. And you are too. Because it takes a lot of effort and sacrifice beside your work, beside your friends, sitting there for a year or two, working on something that nobody wants to hear <laughs> and make it so accessible. Aww. Well, I appreciate you and your candor and your vulnerability. And that is what dogs need to see from us is that soft side so that we can, we can help bring out who they are. And that's our job. And I am so grateful to people like you who are out there, just like me, trying to do the best that we can to teach people that dogs express themselves in ways that we may not like, but how we can help them. How do we create a crowdfunding for you? What, uh, what would be your, your, your idea of like, this is the amount of money we need to get this in the market. And I don't think, you, you, I don't think you're driving a Porsche because of that app. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just every update on, uh, on the phone and cell phone programs, you have to update your app too, right? That's mm -hmm. a lot of money. Somebody sitting there recording the whole thing and make it on mm -hmm. purpose, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be the number that you thought of creating an app that brings that to the next level or updating and improve what you have right now? Hmm. Well, in five years, there's a lot more. Like I said, I can advertise now, which is a big deal, but you, that's very expensive. If I were to updo, you know, upgrade the app and add more to it, that would be asking Lily more, and her fees have gone up in five years. I don't, you know, I've looked at that, and, and to make this thing go viral so that I can actually really add more, and not only to this, but a whole second, third, fourth piece to it, working with people like you, working with vet behaviors. I did this by myself. The next piece of this is going to be with behaviorists, with other trainers, because we need to come together to say, let's, let's have this board of 10 of us and let's do this together, not me doing it myself, which means I'm going to be paying you and paying a couple of vet behaviorists and a Lily again. So it's, it's, it's a lot of money. It's a lot because it, there's a lot to this that I would want to bring people on board, but make it something that you're getting something out of it too. Right. So if I were to throw a number out and say, let's do this to create the next level in, in getting, I would like to at least five, six people on board with me this time. Um, I would, I would have to throw out a figure of probably 50 grand. It's a lot of money because it has to be, everybody has to, feel like their time is worth it too. Yeah, yeah. 
because here are a few things that we have to play with the numbers. Everybody wants to see numbers. Okay, let's give some numbers. One dog that goes into the shelter system for the <laughs> next 13 days costs the system at the public shelter in average, US average, based on, let's say, 2014 data, $75 a day to the system, every dog. 400,000 children get bit every year. <laughs> yeah. And they end up at the ER with a scar in their souls forever. And emotional damage. Right. And likely that dog who did that damage, so these 400 dogs who did the child, bring the child in there, they may end up dead, mm -hmm. killed, which cost also extra money. Mm -hmm. So let's put the numbers together and see insurance should be interested in investing in you and says, hey, you know what? We need that app. Okay, whoever has an app get 5% discount because I know that you know can read your dog that minimize the chances that I have to pay your family for your children's insurance. Mm -hmm. that's, an, that's an important number. And then we have the other factors is well, I'm a dog trainer and I'm, it makes me look good if my clients graduate faster than I expect. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and over the years I have done my sessions down to five five sessions pretty much awesome. average okay awesome. but there's a lot of information and knowledge in there that i have to transmit i have an yeah. app I'm like hey, you know dude click on that link every time your dog shows one of those apps one of those signs yeah and send me that feedback i would like i'll take it mm -hmm. well that's for me easier to communicate with somebody in india or in australia or, or new zealand where yeah. i have a 12-hour interference or in, in, in in between that i can get information of how my clients does it right yeah. now yeah we have apps so far that actually can compare a picture of a dog mm -hmm. and translate that data information through analysis and yeah. tells you what exactly the dog is showing you and what the breed it is right i wish i would have an app that tells me exactly what breed that person has because then i can adjust my training method according to the breed traits right right I'm not guessing yes. around what kind of dog it is just if i know that the breeder is a hunting dog bred with another hunting dog. So I have the two hunting dogs and one herding dog. That's a good information for me to put a yeah. training program together. Yeah. And what makes me happen here is there are so many people out there, they cannot afford training right. because we cannot reach them because me driving to a client is an hour of a drive. I have to charge him twice as much as money that I can charge him online. Right. And I will be right. like there in five minutes until I set up my data and put my screen behind back, make my hair kind of thing, not like now. <laughs> okay, and then have a chat with the person. And you know how online training works. You need to know, you need information and you need to have eyes and ears so you can not only rely on their translation, what they see, right. but you have a common denominator. If I say aggression, it's not growling. That's a fear response. Right. Oh, my dog viciously attacked my other dog. What did he do? Well, he charged forward. Okay, and uh, well, that was uh -huh. it. Oh, okay, which one was aggression? Right. Well, he growled. Okay, he's an Apolitan Mastiff. What do you want him to do? Fart on his way there? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel yeah. you're up, and I have it, I think, for two years. You're four years on the market. Um, I haven't used it a lot, I have to be honest, because I don't use it a lot. I don't use a lot other than design apps so I can post stuff. But every time I was in there, I was like, wow, that's cool. Awesome. Yeah. I, I well, now, now that we've talked about it a little bit, maybe now you'll start to, you know, like I have a lot of trainers that it's a requirement that they have to go through the app before their first lesson. And some do, and they kind of go through it quickly. And then uh, when we have our first lesson, then I'll say, well, do you remember this? And that, so I'll bring it up and I'll show it to him. I did it again today with the shake off. And yeah. it, I think you'll, if you start to bring it out, people will start to pay attention more to their dogs. They just have to see it. Here's what I will do. I have mm -hmm. a mentoring program for people and, and trainers. So what I will do is I put them as a requirement. When they pass the first in the introduction test, I want him to go through that and I want him to give me a score of the tests. I know it sounds silly, but literally some people have no clue. Right. Just because they never saw it, they doesn't know that it exists. Right. 
and all, all these subtle, subtle movements, the difference between having a path forward and a front path next to each other is a huge emotional state of a difference. Yes, absolutely. Patience. I'm so glad you recognize this. I'm yeah. so glad I mean, you recognize I, I didn't. I didn't invent it. It's out there. But we have to have a platform where we put all these things together. I was like, wait a minute. What is? What exactly is that? Paw forward, paw on the side. Huh? Huckles forward, up. Huckles right up, up. Tail lower. And that information is important because we cannot. I don't remember all the breeds. I remember somebody on the street. I was pulling in with my RV with my dogs, and it was a cute dog. I was. I kept trying to try to get engaged with the person, like talking about his dog. And he's like, don't you recognize what breed it is? Um, nope. And he's like, what kind of trainer are you? And I kind of felt embarrassed. I was like, you really? Your dog, as fat as he is, I would call him like a bulldog. And you call it a chihuahua. Anyway, not a big deal. <laughs> but, you know, people have even no clue about stuff. And I, if I have a, train, a, a client with a specific breed, I always have to refresh my memory. Wait a minute. What are the breed traits right now? Okay, what's the crossbreed? How he was assembled? What was his origin? What is his nutritional you know, intake? Uh, oh, okay, now I got, and then I can talk. If you don't know your breed, don't even touch the client. And yeah. I say, if you don't know the dog's body language, stay away from dog training <laughs> in the first place. Yeah. And actually, I wouldn't say don't get a dog, but at least don't train dogs if you have yeah. no clue about body right. language. Yeah, and it's, you know, a lot of the dog training schools that are out there aren't teaching body language, just like a vet school is not teaching body language. I think that is preposterous. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. that, talking, you know what? That's what we should do. We should sit down. Maybe we get a veterinarian. I have a couple of veterinarians who are pretty good about that. Um, let's, let's do a round table about animal body language at the vet's office and applying stress-free veterinary care. Because you have no idea, I work most that's likely a, with lab another... breeds, you mm -hmm. have no idea how many dogs walk home with a severe abuse trauma. Oh God. Vet care. Yeah. And if you take well, it down, if you do a timeline test and yeah. check back the timelines, yeah. some of the dog showing the first reaction to strangers, you end mm -hmm. up being the last vet visit. Right. How would that happen? Because four people held the dog down to trim its nails. Exactly. And the dog was scared shitless. Exactly. Hello. Now, not only he hits the car, not only he has his owner because he exposed him, he's actually is aggressive. Mm -hmm. And don't show it. I know many people got bitten because of that. Yeah. And that just because it doesn't happen immediately doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We right. have children who go through divorce and in the future they will not have children. Hello. That mm -hmm. connection, why we ignore that? Mm -hmm. But now, yeah. finally, we get to the conclusion that dogs do have trauma, they do have accumulated trauma, and they do have stuck trauma. And they have a memory. And they have body memory. Mm -hmm. And going back to those who use the e collar that says, well, the dog doesn't feel it. Well, you know, there is a genetic imprinted body memory that says, whatever touches your neck, it's going to kill you, even if it's just a vibration. You cannot right. ignore that. Well, we have to remember that it's an instinct for a dog to already fear anything coming at the neck because that's how dogs kill each other. They go for the neck. And so just a person just touching a dog at the neck in the wrong way can make a dog afraid. It's instinctive for them to be protective of their neck. So when the shock collar hits the neck, you're already dealing with the, you know thousands and thousands of years of instinctively saying, uh-oh, what's happening? Um, I used the e-collar in the past. I started my career using the e-collar because everybody told me it's okay. And I'm coming from industrial automation and engineering, so I know what this is. I know how it functions. I can actually build one myself before I burn myself with a soldering gun. Mm -hmm. But I always try different positions. Like, what if you put it here? What if you put in two of those? And then I recognize, wait a minute, it's not always the right setting. Different stressors create a different re resistance to the, to the impulse. And then we have... A, a, a trauma here and a trauma on the top these are two different sensations a dog who is being hit by e-collar from below is it's a foundational trauma there is nothing safe in this world mm -hmm. i'd rather have the collar being on the top than being on the bottom to be honest if i would have somebody insist on using the collars dude change the position at least 
don't kill, don't, don't traumatize the dog to that, that he actually doesn't trust himself existing in this world. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was, I had to go through experience so I understand how his system works. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy about that I had to go through this process, but I'm, I'm, happy, I'm grateful that I have learned from that process mm -hmm. and I let these things behind me. Good, good. Well, again, thanks for your vulnerability and your honesty um, because we all have to learn. And I think those, I've never used an e-collar. Um, I've never used a prong collar, but 40 years ago we used a choke chain. Yeah. And, you know, that's what was there. And that's, we didn't have harnesses. We didn't have anything like this, like we have, and we didn't have the, you know, that's what we did. And I never liked it. So I rarely even used them. Mostly I would, and I ended up getting this, the nylon slip collar, yeah. the nylon choke chain. Yeah. They the only we call it that the, um, um, a martingale, but it wasn't even a martingale. No, it was a regular was a choke fit. chain. Yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't a tight fit. It, it was a choke chain, but it wasn't a chain. It was nylon. Gotcha. And yeah. the only reason that, uh, that I used it was because I couldn't, there were no good harnesses 40 years ago, but a dog could back out of their collar. Yeah, but yeah, with yeah. this, they couldn't back out. And then as soon as they realized they couldn't back out, I went to a regular collar. And I was able to train with a regular collar. My but standard it was, is a martingale collar that is adjustable. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you understand how dogs learn, the science of how dogs learn, you don't need a choke chain, you don't need an e-collar, you don't need a prong collar. You just need to understand how they learn and then teach them the way they learn. And for those who watch and don't believe that force fit training works, how about they just follow homeless people with a dog? Absolutely. Why does the dog follow this person who has nothing to feed him, barely share his own food, and yet they are together? So once yeah. we understand the synergistic relationship of animals, yeah. Yeah. not just what we see, but also the energetic value of the synergistic correlationship relationship. they have, then mm -hmm. we recognize this dog is following this person on his own free will. Yeah. Because there's something in for both of them. Yeah instead of judging those poor people and this dog is out there being thirsty, I was like, you know what? This dog, this person doesn't have a slave. They're both free. Yeah. In, yeah. in their one way. Even if it doesn't match our social right. you know, understanding. These two right. people are free. They can do whatever they want, anytime they and want. And they stay together. Each other. Yeah. They, they don't fight with each other. They have no disputes with each other. Maybe about, you know, sitting on the right spot. Anyway. Right. But, <laughs> I think we should we should open up our mind from from um, zoological perspective through the dog's eyes and through the dog's mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to. If we don't do that, we're doing dogs a disservice. Right. We have to look at the world through their eyes, not ours. They are a different species living in our dominated human world, human dominated world. And, and I understand also the fact that some people have difficult dogs. They have been through severe trauma and sometimes it's just the management to keep these dogs alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we're not talking about mass murders here that we have to manage in a social society. They have to, of course, they have to be separated and of course they have to be care of, but they still have to treat them humanely without being judgmental because I don't know where they're coming from they have been abused, so their social behavior is because of their social experience. Right. Dogs are. Yeah. It was really awesome talking to you. I had um, a different ending in my mind, but I love the way we kind of went cross spectrum through everything. Um, I, would, I would love to do another talk at some point. I'll let you pick what we talk about. Okay. Um, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, and I, I would I would definitely support you on that. I would share with my groups. I don't have okay. many. I sounds kind of wow, but I, I have some groups that I really support. Listen, if we affected one person today, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, and that, I, you know, that's so. what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. You know, saving one person, helping one dog, helping a family, helping one mm -hmm. child. It goes all back together. That makes a yeah. big difference. Yes. Helping a shelter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. It was so nice meeting you. 
Nice to meet you too. I totally appreciate you. And let's, I would like to, you know, uh, do a little bit off the air, talk to you a little bit more too. Sure, sure. Let's do that. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.